We are talking this evening about the customs of forest bathing. The Buddha was a very early forest bather. I'm serious. He actually gives instructions. You go out in the forest, he says. You're in the wilderness. And you stop and think. All the concerns of household life, all the concerns of family, they're not here right now. You're surrounded by wilderness. Appreciate that fact. You don't have to carry your home. You don't have to carry your family. You don't have to carry your work here. Leave it out there. Of course, saying that indicates the difference between wilderness now and wilderness then. Back then, wilderness was the ocean of land, and civilization was just little islands of human settlement. Wilderness had the upper hand. Nowadays, wilderness is just little pockets here and there, like the pocket we have here, surrounded by the forest, surrounded by the rise of the land. We have our island of wilderness here. So bring your mind here. Have the perception of wilderness. And allow the concerns of daily life to become small. And appreciate the, the lack of those concerns. It's a kind of emptiness. As the Buddha said, you're, you notice what's present and you notice what's gone. And you appreciate what's gone. The lack of disturbance. You appreciate that lack of disturbance. That's one of the original meanings of emptiness. The mind is empty of disturbance. To some extent. Meditation is a process of gradually making it more and more free of disturbance. And so what are the disturbances in the wilderness? Well, there are animals, and there are what they call non-human beings, beings you can't see. That can be a disturbing thought. You don't know who they are. You don't know their intentions. So the next step is to spread lots of goodwill. There's a passage in the canon where a monk has been bitten by a snake and he dies. And the other monks go and report this to the Buddha. And the Buddha says, well, that's because he never suffused the four families of snakes with his goodwill. This then became a, a chant that has been repeated ever since then. I have goodwill for all the snakes, goodwill for beings without feet, beings with two feet, beings with four feet, beings with many feet. May none of those beings without feet, two feet, four feet, many feet, do me any harm. And then you think about how the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha is unlimited, are unlimited. <clears throat> Whereas a, there is a limit to creeping things. There is a limit even to devas, spirits. That gives you something larger to hold on to. What are you holding on to when you hold on to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha? You hold on to their example of how happiness is found, how danger is avoided. Because the Buddha's teachings really are motivated by a very sharp sense of danger. But the real dangers that the Buddha points out are not the dangers outside. It's not what other people or other beings can do to you. It's what your mind can do to yourself. which your greed, aversion, and delusion can do to you. The causes of suffering, as the Buddha said, come from within. We tend to think of the pains that come from people outside, situations outside, the climate, the economy. And as John Lee once said, those are the shadows of real suffering. The real suffering is in the clinging. Of course, the source of the clinging is in the craving. 
these dangers come from within. And so when you take the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha as your examples, you're thinking of their instructions and how you save yourself from these inner dangers. Basically, virtue, concentration, discernment, all based on a principle of generosity. So stop and think about what that means for a while. Happiness is found through generosity, and then perfected through virtue, concentration, discernment. This is why we meditate. This is how we escape danger. Now, forest is a good place to do this, because as you let go of your concerns about the world outside, It becomes easier and easier in a place like this to allow the mind to settle down. It's worth noting that the oldest wilderness poetry we have comes from the Pali Canon. I mean, there was nature poetry before that, but the nature was the nature of a, of a farm, farmlands, domesticated places. Whereas poetry that really appreciates the wildness of nature as being an ideal place to train the mind. That's something new with the Pali Canon. Even Mahakasapa, who is probably the sternest of all the Buddhist disciples, has a very long poem on the Buddha's, Buddhist attitude towards the wilderness, which is that it's a refreshing place to be. And because you're far from other concerns, when you can put aside your fear of nature, realizing that the real dangers lie inside, then you can focus on dealing with those inside dangers. And the guide for dealing with those dangers is the Four Noble Truths. We often hear that we're here to see things as they are, largely in terms of the three characteristics. But the Buddha never taught that. The three characteristics, he said, are subordinate to the Four Noble Truths. We're here to understand our craving, we're to understand our clinging. We're here to follow the path. It's not so much seeing things as they are, but seeing things as they actually function. How does the mind create dangers for itself? How does it create suffering for itself? Want to get the mind really still, so it can see these things. So you focus on the breath. Focus on any part of the body that you find easy to stay focused on. There's that meditation on the 32 parts of the body. And although in some passages it emphasizes the unclean nature of those parts of the body, to counteract lust and to counteract pride, lust for other people, people's bodies, pride in your own body. It's also just good to keep in mind what you've got here. It can be very common to just think, I've got bones. No matter what happens in the world outside, the bones are still there. I've got this organ, I've got that organ. You can think about all the concerns we have about the comfort of the body, the health of the body, how our metabolism is going, how easy it is to pick up disease, and all the things we do to protect the body. But what is, what is the body? It's just these organs. You want to, you want to make sure that they don't take over. They should be seen as things that you can use for the purpose of doing good, and they're really useful that way. The Buddha never says the body is bad. He just says there's a healthy way of looking at the body and an unhealthy way of looking at the body. A healthy negative image and actually a positive negative image of the body, and then unhealthy positive images. and healthy positive images, and unhealthy negative images, seeing that other people's bodies are beautiful and yours is not.
not healthy negative image, just saying that we're all equal in terms of what we have inside the body. Just as there'd be no point in comparing our livers, who has the most beautiful liver, who has the most beautiful lungs. It's best to see that the body in and of itself is not all that much, but it is useful as a tool. This is what the positive image comes from. Think of all the good things you can do with the body. You can practice generosity, you can practice virtue, you can sit here and meditate. You can focus on the breath, you can focus on any part of the body. A negative positive image would be to say, my body is beautiful. I can use this beautiful body to get other people to do what I want. That just leads to more dangers. So the danger isn't with the body, it's the attitude. So we use the body as a tool to get the mind to settle down. So we can focus on the real dangers inside. They're not the dangers of the civilized world. They're not the dangers of the forest. They're dangers of our own, our own clinging and craving. And we want to see how these things arise. What the Buddha has to say about suffering is really counterintuitive. When you think about suffering, we just think about pain. The Buddha says, no, suffering is clinging. The part that's hard to bear is the clinging. And yet we run to cling to things. The cause of the suffering is the craving, and yet we keep taking our cravings as our friend. This is another aspect of forest bathing. What the Buddha calls physical seclusion is when you get away from other people. But that's not enough. As he says, you tend to go around with your cravings as your friends, as your companions. Whatever they whisper into your ears, you go with it. And if for some reason you can't go with it, you feel frustrated. And the Buddha is basically saying, hey, look, you've got a false friend. The sort of person who gets you to do something against the law, and then when the police come, runs away, and leaves you holding the evidence. Craving doesn't suffer, but it makes you suffer, and yet you treat it as a friend. You've got to look into that. Why is that? You don't see how things function. How does craving arise? The Buddha gives the list. It comes from feeling, or builds on feeling. Feeling comes from contact, contact from having the six senses. The six senses come from name and form. It chases it down through the processes of fabrication. Sankara. They're basically three. There's bodily fabrication, which is your in and out breath. Verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation, the way you focus your mind on a topic and then you make comments about it, ask questions about it. Basically the way you talk to yourself. And then mental fabrication. Feelings and perceptions. The perceptions are the labels you put on things. You identify this as this and that's that. And sometimes your perceptions are accurate and sometimes they're not. And sometimes they're accurate, but they're the kind of perceptions that lead to more greed, aversion, and delusion. What we're trying to find is perceptions that are actually accurate and conducive to getting the mind past suffering, to see through its cravings and clingings. So the Buddha's approach is not just to try to stop fabricating things in these ways, it's to learn how to fabricate these things with knowledge. This is where we focus on the breath, bodily fabrication. You direct your thoughts to the breath, you evaluate the breath. You use certain perceptions of the body, about how the breath enters the body, where the breath originates in the body, what levels of breathing there are in the body. 
sometimes you find that as you're beginning to breathe in, and you're intentionally making the breath do this or that, the breath is actually already moved through the body on its own. You want to detect that to see how that really quick breath can be used. So you consciously put together a state of concentration as a way of studying these fabrications so you can do it with knowledge. And doing them with knowledge creates the path. And as you get hands-on practice with states of concentration, then you can take the insights you've learned about how you breathe, how you talk to yourself, the perceptions and feelings you hold in mind, and how they actually shape things in the rest of your life. And you can catch yourself doing these things in ways that are unskillful, and realize that you don't have to do it in those ways. This is the kind of knowledge, knowledge of things as they function. This is what our forest bathing is for. We benefit from the peace and calm around us, all the green of the trees. The natural quality of nature. So we can focus inside. It's there as a backdrop. And as the Buddha said, it does have its dangers, but you realize that it's the dangers inside that are the really serious ones. There's a famous story in the forest tradition. John Cow was living in a cave for a while. He didn't realize there was a tiger that lived deeper in the cave. It just so happened that when a John Cow was away from the cave, that would be the time when the tiger would enter the cave and leave the cave. Until one night he was doing walking meditation. It was a bright moonlit night, so he was doing walking meditation at the mouth of the cave. And the tiger came along. And as soon as he saw the tiger, he was frozen with fear. But then he realized, which is more dangerous, the, the fear of the tiger? Decided that the fear was more dangerous, so he watched the fear in his mind. Got deep into concentration as the fear fell away. And he just stood there in concentration. He came out, and the mood had moved quite a bit. He must have been in concentration for a couple hours. The tiger was gone. And he learned an important lesson about fear, what the fear came from, why it was there. That's called following the duties of the Four Noble Truths, so you gain a sense of how things function, how states of fear, states of anxiety, states of whatever are put together in the mind. They're fabricated out of these three kinds of fabrication. The question is, how are you talking to yourself? What are the perceptions you're holding in mind? And learning how to breathe calmly as you do this provides you with a safe place. So you can delve deeper into the mind. That's the whole purpose of forest bathing, is to get you focused inside where the real dangers are. Because the, the world of the human, human race is a very distracting world. And it keeps telling you, what other people are doing someplace else is more important than what you're doing right now. Whereas when you come out and you bathe in the forest for a while, you realize, okay, what you're doing right now, that's the most important thing that you've got to take care of. It's a problem if you're creating suffering for yourself, and nobody else can solve that problem for you. But you have the tools that you can do it yourself. So this is why it's the most important thing to focus on. And as the Buddha pointed out, once this problem is solved, then there's nothing else that can weigh on the mind. John Swat one time was sitting in the sala at Wat Metta. He pointed to Mount Palomar, which is across the, the large valley there. 
and ask some of the lay people, is that mountain heavy? No, you know, when an Ajahn asks a question like that, it's a trick question, so nobody dared answer. So he provided the answer himself. He said, if it, you pick it up, it's heavy on you, but if you don't pick it up, even though it's heavy in and of itself, it's not heavy on you. That's what matters. So the disturbances of the world, as long as you pick them up, they're going to keep the mind stirred up. But when you can learn how to put them down, and then learn how to put down the disturbances inside the mind. Then you're bathed. It's an image that occurs many times in the canon. There was a lay person listening to a Dharma talk by the Buddha one time. He gained stream entry while he was listening. He had a servant, and the servant came up to him and said to his master, okay, now is the time to go home and take your bath. And the master said, well, I've already been bathed by the Dharma. Of course, in a culture like India, when they had ritual bathing, the Buddha appropriated that image as well. Those who are truly pure, truly bathed, he said, are those whose minds have no more clinging, no more craving. It's this inner bath that's most important, but the outer bath of the forest provides the ideal location, the ideal environment. So you can focus on where the real problem is and bathe it away.